So our, our next speaker is fairly obvious um, based on this, but Dr. Dave Pike is uh, is with the U U.S. Geological Survey. Um, he is. Don't read it again. Don't read it again. All right. You've already heard him once, um, and so you can just guess that he's still the same person he was. <laughs> Change much. Okay, on this talk, what I'm going to do is take you through a little bit of the work that we've been doing on restoration, some of the restoration research that we've been uh, working on for the last several years. And the approach that we've taken is to try and look more at an ecosystem approach as opposed to what technique to restore what plant. Uh, and by doing that ecosystem approach, I hope to have a better understanding of what we need to replace or repair within the ecosystem at the same time that we're doing the revegetation work. I've always felt like in the past we've kind of taken a shotgun approach to revegetation. That we shoot this big wide pattern and we hope that we hit something. And, uh, and oftentimes I don't know that we truly understand what has gone wrong within the ecosystem? Is it merely that we've lost some plants from this system and that all we need to do is reintroduce them and if we reintroduce them, everything's going to be fine and dandy? Or by the fact that we've had changes that are occurring because of introductions of uh, invasive species on these areas, maybe we've changed the ecological processes in these systems. And feel free to keep coming in. There's lots of seats up in here. And so if we've changed the ecological processes, then in that case, we may need to restore some of those processes at the same time, or maybe even before we start to go through and try and do some of the restoration or revegetation work. So uh, bear with me as we go through this, because we're not going to start talking about uh, native plant restoration. What we're actually going to start talking about first is a little bit associated with the soil microbes below the soil surface. But before we do that, I want to point out once again, I should have talked to Leela about this, <laughs> because there's probably more than 11 sagebrush species in the Great Basin now, but at one point we had 11. <laughs> and, uh, but, but this is a common occurrence that I run into in dealing with a lot of the uh, wildlife biologists that I interact with, and, and this whole idea of you know, sagebrush isn't sagebrush everywhere and that we really need to make sure that we're looking at the right species. And then along with that, within some of these groups, we need to make sure that we're looking at the right subspecies as well. So it really does impact the, the kinds of restoration that we will be doing. And in fact, if you go through and you actually look at some of the revegetation attempts that have gone on with trying to reestablish sagebrush on lands, in many cases, the wrong subspecies has been sown on an area. If they've actually collected seed that was mountain big sagebrush and tried to put it on a Wyoming big sagebrush site. Hey, it failed. Well, gee, <laughs> wasn't enough moisture. So we have different types of sites. They're going to look different, and we need to make sure that we're matching those up. Within these sagebrush systems, our natural fire cycle tends to move through the sagebrush dominated kind of area. The fire coming through, we end up with the bunch grass dominated site, and then ultimately moving into this mixture of sagebrush and bunch grasses. And within these two subspecies of big sagebrush, that cycle can occur 15 to 50 years for the mountain big sagebrush site, but 30 to 120 years for the Wyoming big sagebrush site. So that's a big difference in what we would expect to see in these systems, and these systems are going to behave differently, they're going to have different potential, and we need to make sure that we're taking this into consideration. Now, we introduce cheatgrass into this scenario. It's a winter annual grass. It germinates in the fall, winter, or spring, depending upon when the moisture is available. If the fall cohort dies, the spring cohort comes in, and you still have that plant within the system. Its roots grow when the, when the soil temperatures are cold in comparison to most of our perennials that are native to that system that grow when the soil temperatures are much warmer. Uh, the, the seeds, um, and it seeds and dies at the time period when you lose the moisture. Uh, its distribution is all the way across the United States, but the worst problems really occur in the Intermountain West. And the reason is this closely matches its native habitat where it is also a problem. 
it's, it's not one of these situations where the weedy plant in its native environment isn't a problem. Throughout Europe, it may not be a problem, but you can go to uh, uh, Kazakhstan, where this is a prominent uh, plant. And it's a problem in their locations as well. They have just as many fires. We have the same kinds of problems. And so this is not a situation of it's escaped its predators. This is a situation of a plant that's taken advantage of the, of the, uh, the system. Uh, it survives grazing quite well, and it competes for water and nutrients within our systems. So it's a nasty one. So when cheatgrass invades the system, then we have the fires, and instead of having it come back into that mixture of shrubs and grasses, we're now into this vicious cycle. Well, what else happens when we create this cycle where you have a dominance of cheatgrass on that system? That native shrub grassland system ends up being replaced by the invasive grasses, and uh, the end up getting greater amounts of wildfires. The wildfires now are larger, more frequent, and there are changes that are occurring to the ecosystem processes. And can we then restore native plants in these systems if we have changes that are occurring in the processes that are moving water and nutrients through them? And that's the question that we're trying to understand with some of the work that we've been doing recently. The restoration approach that we're taking, where we're looking at the full set of, of ecosystem components, is to look at plant and animal composition, we look at decomposition, we look at soil nutrient chemistry, and we also look at the soil microbes within that system. And then when and how to restore these systems. Uh, native plant distribution is an important component. We try and match those sites. And then uh, hopefully we go through and do some sort of uh, reduction in the competitiveness of the cheatgrass within, in that area. Generally that has been associated with herbicide applications, but we're using now and starting to focus more on trying to, to use things like prescribed fire, even for cheatgrass management, but also using applications of carbon to the soil. And I'll show you some of the information associated with this. Should we be doing restoration and rehabilitation type projects or should we be focusing towards alternatives? And Val Joe Anderson, once again, I'll plug his talk because he's gonna be talking about assist, assisted succession. I think this is an com important component that we need to look at more broadly across the West and understand where it uh, should be applied. A number of people have worked with us in this. This has not been an effort that I've just worked on by myself. There's been large cooperatives uh, in which we've been involved with, Oregon State University, several other universities, including Utah State, University of Nevada, Reno, BYU, and several federal uh, land management agencies as well as research agencies. So I wanna at least acknowledge the fact that this is not just my work, this is some of the other work that has been done by a lot of these folks. Well, what impacts occur below ground? On the left, you've got the uh, sagebrush grassland. On the right, you've got the nearly cheap grass monoculture. What occurs? On the, on the right hand, or on the left hand side with the, the sagebrush bunch grass system, you have a large amount of biological soil crust at the soil surface. On the cheap grass side, you get thatch. And what that thatch does it tends to shade out those biological soil crusts. They no longer can photosynthesize because they don't get the light that they had. And you end up with generally bare ground under those areas because you begin to lose that soil crust. What happens below that soil surface? Under that sagebrush grassland area, generally we have a prominence of fungi within the soil. There's a, there tends to be a, a, a shift to a more of a fungus dominated soil. If we go to this annual grassland, we get more bacteria. So we are having changes that are occurring in terms of the microbes. And not only do we see it in terms of the micro microbial component, but then when you look at what eats those microbes, you look at the, the nematodes within the system, and it reflects the same thing. You shift from nematodes that would feed on fungi to nematodes that feed on bacteria. And these are the little microscopic worms that are that are in these systems. So what's the consequence of this? If you have the biological soil crust on that soil surface, then uh, once you lose it, 
you begin to lose some soil stability on that site. You start to have soil erosion increasing, and you begin to lose a little bit of that topsoil. Well, the topsoil is not real thick in many of these systems to begin with, so a loss of topsoil can be critical. If we lose the fungi below the soil surface, we're getting decreases in plants, the plant's ability to acquire water and nutrients because those fungi are oftentimes associated with the plants. In some cases, they're mycorrhizal. In other cases, they're merely fungi that are decomposing some of the plant material within that system. What happens then when we move this system to the bacteria-dominated cheatgrass kind of site? We have increased nutrient cycling occurring. The nutrient turnover rates within these systems and the root turnover rates are much higher when we have the cheatgrass within that system. And so we get this positive feedback. Cheatgrass loves to take nutrients up very quickly. It's a good weedy species. It has all those kinds of characteristics. And so what we're finding is the cheatgrass is in fact changing the soil microbes. Those soil microbes turn the nutrients over much quicker, make them more available. And what's the first plant that grows within the system? I already told you, cheatgrass. And so there's this great positive feedback loop. It reestablishes itself within the system. Now, high nutrients, high nitrogen tends to favor those annual plants within the system. If we introduce carbon as a labile source of carbon, a really available source of carbon, then we tend to, uh, well, I'm getting ahead of myself. If in looking at carbon at these sites, on a native site, what we find is that carbon is deep in the soil system and less available. But when we shift it to an annual plant system, it becomes more shallow and much more available. So from restoration then, low nitrogen tends to reduce the competitive ability as we think, at least the size of the annual plants in those systems. And so natives may be able to more may be more able to tolerate the lower nutrient system than the cheatgrasses. And so what we find is Yes, we've got low nutrient systems. Our native plants are much more adapted to those low nutrient systems. Cheatgrass loves a high nutrient system. So maybe there's something there. If we can start to adjust the nutrient availability, we may be able to tip more of a balance to the native plant system and get it away from that that would favor the cheatgrass system. We have not given you a silver bullet. This is not an easy thing to do and it's not going to be uh, cheap, and I don't know that this is the total answer, but this is the direction that we've been going with some of our work. What we've looked at is to actually look at nitrogen availability in these two different types of systems. And so what you see is in the annual system is you have a, almost a, a doubling in the amount of available nitrogen on those systems, and that was fairly consistent. We also pick it up in the plants that are growing in those systems. And so we can get a reflection of that in the plants that are there. So now, talking about reintroducing carbon within this system. Sugar, simple table sugar, is one technique that we've looked at in a number of different studies that a number of us have been involved in. What happens is the soil mi microbes consume that sugar. That's an energy source for them. For every molecule of carbon that they take up, they need to take up some nitrogen. When they take up that nitrogen, they access it much quicker than the plants do. They make it less available to the plants. We then reduce the available amount of nitrogen. By reducing the available amount of nitrogen, we're then lowering the ability for cheatgrass to pick up all that available nitrogen. We're making it a less or a, a more nutrient poor environment. What happens is that our native plants tend to be able to survive that quite well. The, the cheatgrass, however, it ends up being much smaller in terms of its growth. That competitive balance, we have not answered the question yet whether the, by doing this, whether we 
actually shift the competitive balance. And this is the direction that we need to start moving towards in further research, is to understanding whether by doing this, by reducing the amount of nutrients, whether we will in fact tip that balance. Um, I was talking about the, the plants reflecting what will happen. If we apply sugar on these areas, which is indicated by the dark, dark bars, uh, you end up looking at the amount of nitrogen that's being picked up by the, the native plants um, or by the either cheat grass, the bunch grasses, or the sagebrush. What you see is bunch grasses don't seem to be affected nearly as much as things like either cheat grass, which is severely affected in terms of its nitrogen, or the sagebrush. How much sugar do we need to apply? I've had a graduate student, Jesse Brunson, who's just finishing up a thesis on this, and it seems to indicate at this point that it's somewhere between 800 and 1,200 kilograms per hectare. That's a lot of sugar. <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, this right now, if you're going to go out and start spreading table sugar across the landscape, this is not going to be cheap. It's much more expensive than it is to apply an herbicide. So maybe we need to start looking at other ways of being able to make uh, carbon available for plants that could be incorporated into the system. This is a research technique right now to understand how the system works. Then we can start to move in a direction of, of trying to look for a, an approach to be able to, to have. But what we're showing is that somewhere between 800 and 1200 kilograms per hectare is about the level that we get significant reductions in the seed production and the biomass of cheatgrass. Some of this is showing some reduction up in here, but at 300 kilograms per hectare, we're not showing much of a change at all. All right, what about native plants versus cheatgrass? We've had some experiments where we've looked at several different uh, native plants. Uh, as well as uh, I put crested wheatgrass on here and that's, uh, that, that was incorrect. We actually looked at uh, Vavilov, which was uh, uh, one of the other introduced species that, it, that is used uh, that tended to match up better with the sites that we were comparing. Then we looked at areas with and without cheatgrass and then we applied sugar or we didn't apply sugar and we looked at the, the uh, establishment of both the cheatgrass in the areas and, and uh, in the uh, uh, native plants. One of the things that was interesting and somewhat unexpected was the darker bars here are, are when we do not apply, it's when we have no sugar, the lighter bars are when we have sugar. Um, you'll notice that when we apply sugar, we're having reductions in densities of cheatgrass. This was not expected. So not only are we affecting the size of the cheatgrass, but somewhere or another through the processes, we're affecting their, uh, their actual densities on those areas. So, and it occurred in both years, although the second year that we looked at it was, was much less pronounced, but it was a drier year, so we weren't seeing much of a response at all. But that was not an expected result. I didn't intend or expect to see that we'd have an effect on the cheatgrass. I figured it would only be on the size. What about the seeds per square meter? Um, we do get a reduction in the seed production when we apply the sugar. The, the gray bars are, are showing a reduction. And these are the different native plants that we were matching them with. Here's the controls. Uh, here's the Vavilov. And you know, and these are things like blue bunch wheatgrass here and here. What about target species densities? Now, we would expect that if our introduced plant is doing best, that it should be better than most of the natives. And I would argue that it does a little better in one year, but not so much in the other year. So in this particular case, using this particular species that I grant you, uh, this, is, this is just one species that we're comparing. The native plants generally were doing just as well as the introduced species. And this is at eight different locations over the Great Basin, four different states. Okay, shifting gears slightly. Um, 
How do we reduce cheatgrass if we're going to do a restoration technique? There's been a lot of speculation recently about the possibility of using livestock to reduce cheatgrass. Certainly a lot in terms of reducing fuels. And I'll grant you that. We can use livestock to reduce cheatgrass fuel on an area. That's probably a good way if you really have to have a reduction in the fuels on those areas, especially when you have large monocultures of cheatgrass, that would be one way of reducing it. But can we use livestock as a preparation technique for restoration? Can we use them in such a way that we can reduce the seed densities of cheatgrass on a site so that we reduce the density of cheatgrass competing with natives or introduced species when we do a revegetation effort? And what we did was we looked at it based on a clipping technique to begin with, looking at when would you apply of defoliation to try and reduce seed production in cheatgrass and can you get it low enough to where the densities of the seeds of cheatgrass would be low enough to be able to be not creating that competition that might uh, cause death of the, of the native plants. So we did, we did an uh, experiment where we clipped at two different heights it's basically one inch to three inches. And these, this is the recommendation that Jeff Mosley gives for using livestock uh, to control cheatgrass. And so we thought we'd go less than that. And then what phenological stage? We, we clipped at the time that we got the majority of the plants in the boot stage for producing seeds. And then at the purple stage. There, after the purple stage, livestock tend to try and choose something else because you start to get that seed on and, and so forth in there. And then defoliated either once or twice at these different stages. So we have several different treatments. This was all hand clipping. And if we take this level here, which is about, this is a log scale, this is about 300 seeds per square meter. And we've got a publication that's going to be coming out in the next year that looks at how we got to that number. But trust me at this point, that's, that's a figure based on some experiments that had been done in the past uh, that showed that above this level, you have a considerable amount of competition with native plants. Below this level, you have reduced that competition to where it seems to help with the establishment. So about 330 seeds per square meter is that low. We only had one treatment of clipping at one site of the two sites that we looked at where we got below this line. And that was to clip twice at the one inch level at the boot stage. Now recognize, that's clipping all the plants. Livestock tend to be a little more selective. They leave a few here, they move along and take something else over there. So if we're going to use cattle or sheep, we're going to have to concentrate them in an area, make sure that they graze all of the cheatgrass plants. Because what will happen is cheatgrass, especially if you graze too early, cheatgrass will start to turn the tillers down. They become more decumbent and become more difficult for the livestock, especially cattle, to reach their tongue around that vegetation and be able to grab it. So then it produces its inflorescences out this way and still produces the seed. Next year you've still got the same problem. You've reduced fuels, but you've still got the problem with seed production in preparation for uh, restoration. So this is the issue that we're trying to deal with here, is can we use them as a preparation technique? <clears throat> if we do, it's going to have to be combined with some other things, fire or herbicide application spot treatments. So, this is just summing that up, and we really are not thinking that we're going to be able to use this as a good technique to get below that magic level of 330 seeds. What about herbicides? Plateau is one that we're looking at, a number of people are looking at in the West. Its uh, chemical name is Amazotec. We looked at it at two different levels, four ounces and six ounces per acre. Uh, we used the higher amount when we had the litter on the soil surface. We used this both with cheatgrass and medusa head. 
We also did the applications of the herbicide. We also went through, we, I speak as we. Uh, my graduate students went through and weeded cheap grass and Medusa head out of plots. I went out there one day. That was a token favor on my part. Uh, and then we measured cheap grass and Medusa head densities afterwards. And what we see is that a Mazepic reduced the densities of Medusa head, but not necessarily for cheatgrass. So if you're applying plateau, don't expect that you're going to kill all the plants. They may totally survive through the growing season. But if it works correctly, it does a pretty good job of controlling the seed production. So in the following year, you may not have nearly as many seeds. So the way that the action of this particular herbicide on the plant isn't going to necessarily kill those annual plants, but it may in fact affect the actual seed production. When did you apply the mesopic? It was applied in the fall. Wow. Yeah. We also used burning along with this. Uh, that didn't necessarily seem to help. It was really the herbicide treatments that were the ones that tended to reduce the seed production. What other avenues are we pursuing? At the soil microbe level, we're looking at different techniques to try and get more refined in what microbes are actually there. Uh, PLFAs is phospholipid fatty acids. And we're using some DNA analyses to actually try and key in on what fungi and what bacteria are in these areas when you have an annual grass dominated site versus a perennial, um, a native perennial dominated site. What we're looking for here is do we have a complete shift in species composition of the microbes? Or is it merely uh, a complete dominance change, I guess? versus a, a, a minor shift. Because it could be that when cheatgrass gets into that area, yes, we're shifting to fungi over bacteria, but all of the species may still be represented. If that's the case, then maybe all we need to do is get the native plants back on those systems and they're going to be fine. But if we're losing species out of that system, it may, may be more important to look at techniques that may help us in beginning to get those microbe species back in. Sugar versus fructose, corn syrup. Uh, it's a, a cheaper technique, and so it might be another one that we could use. So that's one that I would encourage some further research on. We're looking at tackifiers as a way of being able to apply some of these things. Hydromulching is oftentimes used in roadside revegetation. Uh, we had, I had one graduate student who looked at different kinds of ta natural tackifiers. They have carbon sources in them. The longer chain the carbon source, the less impact that it has on the, the plants. The shorter the chain, however, it may be a source of carbon that would be available for a longer term for breakdown by those, by those microbes. And so that might be a way of being able to apply sugar and make that carbon available. Perennial plant gaps. When we do a revegetation and a restoration project, how important is it to fill those gaps back in so that you no longer have those spaces for invasion of cheatgrass? And maybe a way in which we go through and determine whether we need to restore or revegetate a land. And I'd like to at least uh, end with uh, those groups that have given us support in terms of financially as well as their help on various projects. Thank you. What did we apply? Sorry? How did we apply it? As a control. Oh, as a control? Uh, no sugar. But, we, but the way in which we got the sugar on was to uh, just dust it on the soil surface and then we lightly watered it in. And so we did the same with the lightly watering in for the controls without the sugar on it, of course. They had not germinated. So it was right uh, It was right around late October, early November. We had, had not had any rain yet. Uh, the forecast for the next rainstorm was coming in the next week. 
And so we tried to do the application as it's recommended, which is to get it on just before uh, precipitation fall. That moves the herbicide down into the soil, and on our sites we have a little bit of clay associated with it, so we have good contact and good retention in those areas. Over here, Lucy. I seem to recall um, some work showing that uh, cheap grass seems to be able to move into um, into more or less pristine uh, native playing a bunch of grass habitats, which I guess I'd have you comment on that in terms of the either capability or effectiveness of worrying about patches and perennial cover uh, in restoration when they seem to be able to get into what appears to us to be a fully occupied site and yet apparently it's not. Uh, well, you know, it's, it's a scary issue. Uh, we're working on some locations that haven't been grazed for now about 10 to 15 years on Hard Mountain rest, uh, Fish and Wildlife Refuge. And uh, um, we were shown some areas where they had done some prescribed burning. Now, one side of the road, they had done the prescribed bur burning. The other side of the road, supposedly, was a similar kind of sagebrush bunch grass habitat. Um, the sagebrush bunch grass habitat, when I looked at it, had very little cheap grass in it. Had patches like you're talking about. So I would have thought that you wouldn't have a problem. And in fact, given Mike Wisdom's maps of elevation and so forth, this indicated that this was not an area where it would be a problem. They did this prescribed fire, and we've got a lot of cheap grass in that area right now. It's and so I'm not sure what the answer is on that. That's one of the research studies that we have is to try and pinpoint a little bit of that. Great, thanks, Dave. Um, <laughs>